So, um, you know, AI, right? Uh, that's what brings us here, AI and health. And uh, when you think about the VA, it's, uh, depending on the metrics, it's the largest civilian uh, agency uh, by some metrics. And uh, we have an important mission in serving uh, veterans. Um, and uh, so there is the largest integrated healthcare system in the country is in the VA. Uh, I heard earlier, I think there was someone in the audience from the VA. That's because the VA has facilities across the country. It's not only in Washington, D.C., it's not only uh, in each of the states. There's, uh, did you know there's, um, uh, there's a site also, for example, in the Philippines, in Guam, in the Caribbean. Um, and so it is um, actually, uh, there are many of these medical centers serving our veterans. And, and, uh, and so it's really an important mission. And so when we think about AI, we also have to be kind of careful about AI. You know, AI is learning, but how much can we trust the AI in this stage, much like perhaps a toddler stage. I don't know if, how many people have a toddler. I have a four, four year old. Um, some people have, uh, are we kind of graduated that phase? But, um, but yeah, we have a four year old and I wouldn't be surprised if he would try to pick up those stairs uh, to, on, on the way the deck there's like these portable stairs. Uh, if he saw that sign in case of fire, take the stairs or, and we definitely have this happen, you know, uh, call me cab and they get called, you know, call cab and so forth. So uh, a lot of things around context, different words meaning uh, different uh, things in different situations and, and AI is learning about them. But um, when it is uh, something uh, related to a creative endeavor or something where you, that you have multiple options and it's okay, that's okay. But in health, if you're picking the wrong option and you know not calling uh, the cab means that they don't make it to the you know their surgery on time, it, it could really be you know a serious issue. So uh, you know just as an, an example there, when we think about AI, the other piece that's really interesting is that it is growing exponentially. So people often assume that at the beginning of an exponential curve that there's li it's, it's linear. It, it really looks linear to, to people kind of at the beginning. Uh, and that's, you know, that's kind of, we're probably a little bit past that, but this, this chart's from a little while ago. But um, if you think about kind of um, what people think is happening, kind of that gray line, they think it'll kind of grow uh, linear, right? And even uh, our knowledge will grow linear and perhaps the AI would grow a little faster uh, than that, and but still potentially in a kind of a sub-exponential sort of regime. Um, but what happens is essentially if you've got a line and you've got an exponent, at some point they're gonna cross. Um, and that is, what's special is that's happening in our lifetime. I, I mean, think about it, no time in history before has something called AI been considered, been able to beat humans on metrics. Uh, you know, metrics that we, just a little while ago, were like, oh yeah, no, you know, they, they, maybe they beat us in chess, but you know, they won't beat us in Go, or you know, they won't, they can beat us in Go, but they'll never fool us that it's really a human if, if I don't see who the person is, you know, the, the Turing test or reverse Turing test, you know. Each one of those, um, we're actually starting to see uh, superhuman performance and actually in recognizing images. If you've seen images of, uh, have you seen the ones with the muffins? Uh, that kind of looks sometimes like a dog with kind of like, they have like three blueberries. It could be two eyes and a nose or a mouth. And, and it turns out that, I mean, you can find out the truth. Well, who took that picture? What was that? And, and the computers are doing better than the humans are on those uh, tasks now, right? People would not have thought of that a few years ago. So uh, there are now startups being formed toward uh, super intelligence. Now there's also kind of the scary side that people are talking about, kind of the and you're seeing that in the movies, Terminator and all that, those may be, you know, the, we're not gonna debate about that, but uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, the growth is much faster than we think it will be once it really hits the, um, kind of an inflection point in this uh, exponential curve and it starts to cross each of the critical points, um, which happen only once at, at different types of metrics that we're using to compare to humans. Um, so what, what is AI and, you know, in, in the first place here, why, why are we talking about it? Um, well, you know, I have to give one of these definitions, you know, from the government uh, here. So this is the one that we use. There's other ones from 2020. There's a few other definitions, uh, but this one's cited a lot. Um, and essentially it's like being able to do all these like human level kind of um, 
decisions or cognition and in some ways having a little bit of a black box, not being able to fully define with rules what the outcome will be. So to us, it may look like it's either probabilistic or that we can't exactly predict what the outcome would be. And if we can't predict the outcome, how, do we, how can we control what uh, the results will be, right? So that's where people start talking about guardrails and, and, and things like that. Um, you know, so I alluded to a little bit about why AI at the VA. And, um, you know, one is, you know, we do have those nine plus million veterans that are active in the integrated healthcare system, right? In the medical, we have a medical record which is consistent across these different hundreds of, of uh, centers. Um, and um, we have um, over 100,000 clinicians across all those centers. It's, it's larger than just the number of clinicians, larger than many agencies. And it turns out even the ones that are not at the VA, at one point, the majority of uh, doctors and nurses do at least part of their rotations, their fellowships, some part of their training at the VA. So the impact is much bigger than only on uh, VA and veteran patients in terms of, of, of future work that we see from uh, physicians and nurses. Um, you know, in terms of um, the uh, genomic uh, research, I mean, certainly there are genomic tests that are done for clinical care, cancer, precision uh, oncology, and so forth. But we do also have, and we just celebrated getting a million uh, veterans in the Million Veteran uh, Program. Uh, there's a celebration on that actually in September. Uh, it happened a little while ago, but now we have the numbers, and it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful resource. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about how that resource is, is used and, and, and uh, you know, some of the challenges around that. Uh, but a uh, great resource and we're aiming to, uh, to gain more uh, different types of information other than the genomics that will be kind of combined together with that. Um, there's uh, 10 billion medical images just, you know, through routine clinical care. Uh, you know, obviously some come through research, but uh, it's about a billion images a year. Uh, it's quite a few, right? Um, where do you store that? How do you process that for research? Um, as I said, 1,200 medical facilities, um, uh, you know, I would say more like hundreds of ones that are actively doing research, right? They're not all doing research. Um, and we have, and this was really important during COVID, you know, over 2 million uh, televisit, telehealth visit episodes per year. So really a great opportunity to build on that and have a lot of information from that. Um, so we did, we recently were analyzing, well, what are the areas of strengths of the VA? Like when VA funds research, where do you see it making an impact compared to non-VA funded research, right? Uh, in this area of, um, in, in the, these different areas. And we found that uh, cancer diagnosis and treatment is one where we have a, a definitely a higher uh, average, you know, mean impact factor of like, you know, 14, it's about double to non-VA funded research, another one. And one reason that's important is, well, you know, we do have a lot of cancer within the VA, so there is an emphasis on that. It's one of our top priorities uh, because of burn pits, toxic exposures, and the fact that veterans are more likely to get different uh, types of cancers. Uh, dermatology and skin health, again, relates to uh, burn pit exposure and, and uh, chemical exposure and so forth. Uh, again, um, significantly higher impact factor for those kinds of papers. So these are areas where we have strengths. Strengths which later I'll tell, talk about maybe areas maybe we would want to collaborate, right? Um, and then genetic and genomic research. I mean, obviously through the Million Veteran Program, uh, yeah, Million Veteran Program and, and other uh, actually clinical genetic uh, screening and work that's done, there's a, a strength in the impact of that work. And then another one of our top priorities, it's been so for a number of years, is mental health and behavioral health, uh, suicide risk, uh, post-traumatic um, stress disorder, and other types of uh, conditions related to mental health make that a priority. And the mean impact factor at 16 is far above kind of the six average for non-VA funded research there. Other areas where we really have seen a lot of strengths are in orthopedic musculoskeletal health, especially there if you look at uh, rehabilitation technologies, prosthetics, there's a lot of work going on there, looking at um, robotics for the future, things like that. And then uh, nutrition and, um, and diet. Uh, 
what are things that can be done kind of in the longer term. A lot of these individuals are older and, and thinking kind of as what, what are uh, non-medical, non-surgical approaches that can, be that can be helpful for them for the rest of their lives. Now, it turns out we have about half as many papers on machine learning and AI and healthcare relative to kind of non-VA funders, uh, which is kind of interesting because we have all of this data, right? We have um, a lot of clinicians who are interested in clinical questions. And so what we find is there, you know, there are issues around infrastructure, recruiting talent, specifically in the AI space, and also uh, this need to collaborate with universities. We collaborate often with medical schools that are associated with a VA in some way, uh, but we have not had as many collaborations with schools, um, you know, such as this one here, right, Rice, uh, which is really known around engineering, uh, but doesn't itself have a medical school that is affiliated with a VA directly, right? It may have uh, collaborators in medical schools and those are affiliates and so forth. And so we're working toward that. And that's one of the reasons why I was really excited to come here uh, to, to this, because you know a lot of times we kind of travel to, I mean, like I said, there are hundreds of these medical centers that want to hear about AI and all that. Um, but often I get the same you know, interest. It's like, oh, we want to do AI. How do we do AI? Uh, we have all these questions to ask. And, but here I feel, first of all, with all the medical schools here, certainly you have questions that you'd want to ask as well. And then there's going to be, I, you know, myself coming from an engineering background uh, that I feel like here there's going to be an ability and interest to work toward deeper solutions uh, to solve those uh, when there are challenges that come up. So let me tell you what, you know, I've worked on so far to try to uh, build up AI R&D. When I came there really, you know, I mean, people, I came about five years ago, people, you know, some people didn't know, you know, say AI, what is AI, right? Uh, um, I, that may have been true with some of the public as well, but now everyone knows what AI is. They just don't know how to get into it. They all want to get into it. Um, and so we are working toward building these sites uh, that can kind of uh, consolidate some AI expertise together with uh, clinicians that have some questions that may be interesting to ask. So basically, you know, do R&D, pilot, iterate, and scale. Uh, and also have a diversity of talent. Um, there's a, uh, both in terms of um, the people working on the projects, there's a diverse population in, uh, in our databases. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, potential. Uh, that's what I would say the VA is really a lot of potential and, and now we're ready to take the next step forward. So um, if you take a look at AI use cases at the VA based on an executive order definition, so basically, it just defines what is a use case based on kind of that definition that I gave before and a few modifications. Um, th these are the sites where we have, uh, you know, bigger circle kind of more use cases there. You can kind of see it's kind of uh, distributed near water sources. I don't know why that is, but uh, if, 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 if you live near the water as opposed to a land border like with Canada, I don't know, something went wrong there. But, um, but what we do know is that, um, that you know, certain places have interest in AI, potentially because they have some universities there, and certain places, maybe because they don't have some AI expertise nearby, um, are, do not have that advantage to do that work, but they want to, right? And that's one reason we set up these kind of four sites here. You can see they're in the four, well, we have like these four regions. So they're in kind of like four regions that um, had some AI interest, but weren't necessarily, um, you know, like a, some of the huge hubs like you see here that, you know, that are, uh, that are others represented. Um, and this is kind of the latest map of where AI r and is, is happening at the VA. You can see it, it is, um, you know, it's, it's definitely, so first of all, this is R&D as opposed to just general AI use cases. So there is some overlap. Um, uh, so wherever there's R&D, it's either the bigger institutions or R&D leads to uh, AI being used or there's more knowledge in AI, a number of possibilities to explain that. But, uh, but I just wanna say that it's not just isolated in one or two places. Um, there are many places where AI is happening. And in fact, 
uh, one of them uh, was through work someone over in uh, associated with the Nevada site, um, which kind of was one of the premier papers on AI and uh, came out about, I think it was uh, in 2019 or so. Let me see, uh, I think it was like July, yeah, July 2019. Um, and uh, related to predicting acute kidney injury 48 hours in advance. If you can do that, you can actually prevent the disease from happening in that, uh, you know, the clinical manifestations go, don't get worse, so you don't actually see it clinically. But, you know, it was actually happening. Uh, it's just that you were taking measures to actually stop it from getting worse and kind of reversing. So um, through fluid retention, other approaches, um, you can do that if you can predict it. And this was kind of one of the first um, you know, pilots that was done leveraging uh, deep learning. Now there are over 300 studies, uh, you know, just when I was looking last week, that are somehow using AI. Uh, most of them are not using, you know, large language models. They're using maybe NLP and things like that. Um, but uh, there is definitely AI uses. Um, you know, I just wanted to make sure to state, you know, that in the federal government, there are a lot of uh, different um, kind of guidances and rules about when, how to use AI. And so what we've done is put them together and made an agency specific, uh, trustworthy AI set of principles. Um, and this is not really to read through all of them, but just to say that these are some of the ones that we considered. And we created one of the first um, AI, agency AI strategies um and uh, by bringing together over 20 some offices so there's a lot of different stakeholders that are interested in ai um in our four strategic pillars and you know this ai strategy was written as like a three year and then you have to do you have to renew it and we're due for a renewal but um but currently you know it has you know using existing ai what ai approaches do we have that we can already use to improve outcomes and experiences for our veterans Increase our VA AI capacity and capability is part of what I'm working on with those sites and developing R&D and uh, increase veteran and stakeholder trust in AI. We ran a few conferences and uh, to do that engagement and, and found that 92, in one case 96%, in other cases, felt that they increased their trust in the VA after we shared uh, the trust with the AI framework and, and listened to concerns that they had and took that into account. And then <clears throat> we want to build upon the VA's existing partnerships uh, across agencies and industry and to enhance and build new ones. Like I was saying, perhaps outside of medical centers so that we can uh, attract either faculty into the VA or collaboratively. And I'll talk about a couple of mechanisms on that. That ends up being one of the favorite parts, I think, for some people in the talk. So um, the VA Trustworthy AI Framework, I guess what's unique about it is that not only does it integrate all those other federal ones, but it also integrates a few VA specific uh, points that we had. Uh, we have some uh, data ethics frameworks and things like that that were added in. Um, and through that framework, now all new AI use cases that, um, that uh, are going to be used operationally have to pass this framework. That's what the organization has adopted in any contracts have to uh, satisfy this, this framework as well. So that way there's kind of a standardized way of thinking about things and veterans can be assured that we are taking that into consideration. Um, in terms of research, uh, it's important to take these kinds of things into account if it affects a veteran's care, right? If you have, for example, a prospective study. But if you're doing a retrospective study, certainly you want to keep these in mind. Uh, but um, that it's not kind of put into uh, the executive orders is something that is required. Um, just wanted to tell you a little bit about, you know, so what are our approaches in terms of recruiting talent? Um, and so for one approach is obviously recruiting talent, but the other approach is we have a lot of people, right? It's the, like I said, it's the largest civilian agency by some metrics. Um, and some of them have technical skills. You've got uh, pharmacists, you've got uh, chemists. I mean, you've got a lot of different kinds of people and that potentially could adopt uh, AI skills, right, and knowledge. And so we did develop this program and actually work with six agencies on it um, to create, to actually use AI. It's kind of like a meta thing. You use AI to find a, a path along the career and of all these skills and classes you need to take to get to a point that you determine that you want to do to get to an AI. So imagine like 
uh, you know, a maps app, you know, I want, I'm here and I want to get to, uh, I don't know, the, you know, the medical center that's like uh, kind of a, you know, a couple miles away. Well, what's the best route to get there? Well, you know, actually AI, it uses AI, right? To, to, as you do your GPS and so forth, right? That's kind of what this is a GPS to, to get you to where you want to be in your learnings of AI. Um, and, um, and so yeah, these are a few of the key partners. Uh, we actually ran this as an AI tech sprint, which is one of the approaches that I'll mention a little bit, is the way we do competitions to encourage working with others outside the VA. And one of the ways that we can uh, legally give out money, um, one of the things that's interesting in, in um, you know, VA and other agencies, there's sort of rules about where, when and how you uh, give money to different types of entities. Um, and this prize authority is one way that has been proven valuable uh, for a number of agencies that, are, that we've seen. Um, well, I'm not gonna have time to really go through uh, how the Aspire works, but just say that it uses a combination of gamification uh, and kind of short sort of uh, courses um, to get you from you know, place A to place B in terms of uh, what type of job. Uh, you might be capable of doing and then you get badged for it and then we're working with other parts of government to have those badges be uh, synchronized and recognized so that uh, they could be useful if you cite them uh, as something that you know you, you have that knowledge uh, gained um, so now uh, at least for some people this is their they find this a really interesting part it's like well this is really nice we, you have all this data you have all this stuff but you know, how do we work with the VA? You know, we, we've heard it could be tricky, right? How do you get access to that data? How could we uh, get a grant from the VA? Things like that, right? And that's what this slide is, and the subsequent ones are to address that. Uh, yeah, how many people have ever thought that? I wonder if this is a room for that. Like, uh, oh, I wonder how I could get a grant from the VA. I wonder if I could get that data and do, and do a new research project, right? Well, we've got a, a few very enthusiastic hands up, so that is a good sign because um, it's a good sign because what I'll tell you is it's, it's not easy, but if you're, like I saw a few people really raising their hand, that's the, this is the opportunity then for you, right? Because it does require some work, but the, um, the rewards are there. That's what I would say. So um, option one, if you are a small business, there's certain, uh, or business tied to another business that has already won a contract, there's, um, and individuals do this too. I know I'm working with someone who's a professor who actually uh, is really a contractor, uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, but is, is just to win a government contract, basically, or to win, to be uh, hired by someone who won a contract. Uh, one example of this that we're participating in is called Accelerating VA Innovation and Learning. It has AI as one of the categories, $650 million. Doesn't mean that you get it all for your organization, right? But, you know, money has to be put at it and, and different components will get different parts. Um, but that's an example of a contract. Uh, there's special opportunities for um, service disabled veterans and, um, and, and, and others. Um, to for special vehicles as well. Um, the other one I wanted to mention, and which we'll talk about as an example in, in detail, is the idea of an AI tech sprint uh, and faculty challenges. So this is the idea of these prizes, where um, there's an authority where we can give out prizes, which is basically like a gift. If you win the prize, you can technically spend it on whatever you'd like, um, but we can make metrics of why you should get the prize, uh, which take effect until you get the prize, basically. So, um, so for example, and we'll, well, we'll talk about a few examples, but one of them is like we'd have a theme, like we are interested in veterans that are not currently being engaged in some way. Uh, can we use AI to do that? And so people propose different ideas, uh, and then we'll look at what they proposed. They might have a little demo or something, and, and after that, uh, we'll pick a prize winner. Uh, the day after that, they don't have to do anything else, actually. But a lot of them are very motivated, like, you know, some of the people are raising their hand to continue the work. I mean, they're just motivated in this area, right? So they will then continue. And, and because there was a national competition done for the prize, it is much faster than to get a contract or, you know, some other way of funding that next bit of work. 
Um, just an example, we had that now with AI text prints that we just had around ambient voice dictation. So you're with a physician patient there, uh, you know, they're talking with consent, of course, you're capturing that conversation and then turn it uh, with, you know, a large language models into a summarized note, formatted correct, like a soap note kind of note with, with the billing codes ready to go, which of course a physician can look at later and, and edit and stuff. But, um, but the fact is that it makes it a lot easier and faster and it lets them talk to the patient, look at the patient and engage rather than, you know, uh, kind of one of these things that you sometimes get or like at night they're typing it uh, and they don't maybe remember everything and um, and it may not have the same quality. So um, so that's an example where uh, competition ended at the end of May, uh, first contracts awarded July 15. Now if anyone has been with government, you know that is very fast, right? And that's because we did this approach of getting it all set in sequence. And the, and the sprint itself is only three months. So this is all much faster. <clears throat> than kind of the usual processes in these. So we're thinking of adapting that, and this is where you know input, input from some of you all may be helpful uh, at some points, um, is to faculty challenges. Like, could we have this idea where um, you know faculty or departments apply for like, oh, here's something that could be done, and then we could give out a prize for that. Uh, then they could decide you know to do that or not if they like, but uh, we would be able to then learn what are these interesting ideas that people are working on. Maybe it would set up collaborations uh, for the future. Maybe people would be interested then to be, uh, to work in our, uh, one of these other programs, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, and move forward. So uh, next one I'll talk about is this uh, inter Intergovernmental Personnel Act. Anyone heard about this one? My guess is not too many, but I do see a couple of hands. Oh, yeah, over on this side. Yeah, okay, there we go. So yeah, so you guys move over here now. Um, so over, so I'll talk to this side then. Uh, so basically, the IPA is the idea is if you're a faculty, um, part of your time could be loaned to the government. So that means the government is paying part of your salary at your university rates, not at the lower government rates, at your university rates. Uh, there's some questions on the overhead: is that the same or not? Right? That is kind of a negotiated sort of thing, and. Uh, may vary, but, but they're paying the actual salary uh, at the rates of the school uh, at when they started the program. You, you must, there are a few rules like you must, uh, you can't just suddenly jump in the university and say, hey, I'm gonna be, pay. you have to be there for like 90 days, you know, a few things like that that are reasonable, it seems, but, um, but that is a way that uh, uh, we could work together where you keep your appointment, uh, potentially. Um, the other way is, uh, you know, you could actually, uh, if you want, you know, to do kind of whatever project you want, you could be paid by university and, and just come and work at the VA and then get access to that data. And the two ways to do that are, or there are at least two, but one of them is that IPA way. Uh, another is to just become a VA partly an employee. So that means that you signed up for all the considerations around data sharing and all that of, of the VA and are potentially being paid by the VA if you have a grant from the VA. Um, as a VA employee, or you could be a worker without compensation, which I thought was <coughs> kind of interesting <coughs> when I first saw it. Why would I want to be a worker without compensation? Isn't that like, is that like a volunteer? Like, but, uh, but what it really is, is it, it is a way that um, people have as a way, they use that as a way to get access to data and essentially to do projects that they need to do, right? So you're still a worker, that's what you get, because if you're a volunteer, you're not a worker. Without compensation means, yeah, you don't get paid, but, but you do get access to work on projects as a worker, right, which is the nice thing. Uh, and so you basically have to team up with some team where you could be that worker. Uh, if, maybe if you're a worker for long enough uh, on a project you like, you could then apply for a grant where you become a worker with compensation too. Uh, so, you know, they're just, you know, it, it's, uh, it sounds like an interesting word, but it actually at the VA has an interesting meaning. It's, it's kind of a unique position, the VA. I don't know of other places that have this uh, notion. Um, and one reason why it becomes useful is because we actually have an intramural research program. So we're not, uh, that's why I think a lot of people didn't raise their hand at the beginning about knowing and it, like, we don't give a research grant out to just a university uh, 
you know, just like that, kind of as an extramural. Like you have to be part of, um, affiliated with a VA in some way, either a medical school affiliate, um, uh, you know, apply for a grant that then turns you into a VA um, employee, right? Something like that. And so in the intramural program, there are many uh, different grant opportunities, <clears throat> but they would pay you for your time as a VA employee and not as a university uh, person. So you would like decrease your time as a university person and get more time. And that happens. Some people are like partly on the VA, partly university. There's a lot of different, and it can change over time. So these are ways of collaborating. And I know it is a little complicated, and that's why I wanted to go into it, because different people are interested in different things. Uh, so now we're in kind of the tail end of the, con of the conversation, where I want to just tell you one example of, you know, of these ways of collaborating, which is called AI Tech Sprints. And I picked this one because it ended up being named in the executive order that just came out in last October, uh, the big one on AI, you know, safe, uh, you know, secure, trustworthy AI. Uh, for the VA, there's one thing that it named that it specifically had to do, and that was uh, an AI tech sprint, uh, actually two of them. And one of the ones we did was, as I mentioned, about um, about that ambient voice dictation. The other one we did that year, this past year, was about um, how, when you go to the community, it, like usually you go for your care in the VA. Uh, in fact, the VA's quality is rated very high, and you know a lot of people are going with the VA, but sometimes they have to go outside the VA for some reason. Well, when they come back, how do we get their information, right? And so that's what the other um, yeah, textbook was about. Uh, you know, we might get a fax, we might get an image, like a picture. How do we use AI to change that into something that a doctor can actually use once it come back, comes back to the VA? Within the VA system, it's all electronic, everything automated, but outside, it could be an issue. Um, so, you know, the idea with the ethics process is kind of like you have three months, you work and get to know the different parties. Um, now, I, I have, um, you know, I found that with contracting, it's not only what they say they will do, but, um, you know, it's kind of like an, like an election in some case. You know, people will say different things that they want to do, uh, but for different reasons, either they're not, they, either unable to do it or they didn't understand what it would take or something, or they're new, you know, whatever it is, they, they don't execute it, right? And so during these three months, um, we're able to really engage with them and see what they did, you know? Um, and then after that, uh, because it was a national competition, we can then get a contract much faster. And luckily during that time, we actually got to know a little bit about how, how they did. Um, <clears throat> one time someone told me, so it sounds a lot like uh, nine, this TV show called 90 Day Fiance. I don't know if people have seen that. But basically it's like someone comes over from another country. It, they have a special visa in 90 days. If they decide to get married, they can stay. If, and they get to know each other during that time. If not, then they have to leave, right? So uh, the, I guess they give the analogy because here it's like the companies get to hang around. We get to know them. Uh, and then if... You know, if it doesn't turn out, I guess they, you know, they'll, they, you know, that that prize that uh, I guess or that in this case it's a, you know, it's it's a that working relationship probably won't continue, right? And maybe they'll go to another um, agency or something. So, uh, and I think one reason is because it, it is 90 days. It is a 30 day or sorry, a three month sprint, which is approximately 90 days. Um, so, uh, t I'll tell you a couple examples from that. You know, one we had. Um, Non-adherence to medications can account for about 50% of treatment failures and around um, a quarter, uh, quarter million, uh, 125,000 deaths, um, and actually 25% of hospitalizations each year in the U.S. Um, and so one of the organizations for that um, created this medication adherence application, which used a number of government uh, APIs, ways of communicating data. Uh, a, a number from HHS, I think we heard from an HHS speaker a little while ago, so for everything from FDA, VA also has an API with data, census data, and, and other data. Um, and I'll show you here a, a little video, if you can see it. See, what you do is, you know, your camera, your, your phone has a camera, right? And they have these pills, I guess they just put on their, their laptop there, but the, it automatically identifies the pills they have um, and it looks in their medical record uh, because at the VA you can 
tied to the medical record if you want to, right? Um, and it says like, oh, you're missing, you forgot to take this pill, or oh, there's this pill that's not yours, you know, uh, or that's the wrong dosage. It can figure all of that out with all these APIs because it had the pictures, the image recognition, the tie back to your medical record. You know, that's the kind of um, technology that I think, you know, we can have that is especially gonna be helpful for kind of an elderly patient. Uh, right now, I think the best thing you kind of have are these pill boxes and, you know, to make sure you didn't forget something, you know, is it still there, is it not there? But um, this is kind of another approach that was, that was done uh, by one of the winners. Another example, and then we'll close if we have time for questions, is this uh, notion that um, we have data and HHS has data in CMS, um, in, in uh, Center for um, Medicare. And, uh, and Medicaid as well, but um, in particular, a lot of our veterans get um, drugs through that program as they get older. And so there's some potential synergy between our 9 million, or oh, there is synergy between our 9 million and the 50 million. There's a, a quite a bit of overlap. <laughs> and so we wanted to, make, to see if they could log in, see the information from both their CMS uh, portal through API again, application programming interface, as well as the veteran electronic medical record, put all that together to see if they're looking for a clinical trial. Um, again, let's say for cancer, for COVID, they could actually do that themselves or their caregiver can do that. Um, and then it kind of automatically looks for trials based on the conditions that are known in their medical record and so forth. And so one of our goals was, let's try to make this as easy as possible. Like, I mean, can, could high school students do this? No, right? But we actually got high school, I mean, we got a number of different parties from large, huge companies, but, but this was an interesting contestant. I think got uh, honorable mention, if I recall. <clears throat> but, um, but, you know, they build this clinical trial selector um, and they ended up, uh, some of the large companies, I, I think it was Amazon, got really interested to work with them uh, <clears throat> on this idea and gave them credits and so forth. The idea, again, being that you can take all of the data uh, that the patient has about themselves, uh, but doesn't maybe know what it is, and then use AI to help them find trials uh, that might fit for them. Um, and then here's where we kind of put it in the VA app gallery. It was one of the first five. Uh, and I think this is a quick video kind of showing how a user kind of goes into the app. They basically log in. Um, and uh, they authenticate and all that, and that lets you them see their data both in the and this is the Medicare one. So right now the two they have to log in separately. You know these are two different agencies at this point, um, but uh, it gets their data, and then uh, they they ask it finds you know what kind of trials they're eligible for. Some people want to be on a trial because you know they may be paid to be on a trial, right? It could be a source of income for some. They they have a condition, and they'll and they'll be the normal case for, perhaps. Uh, but in some cases they, or the controlled case. In some cases they have a disease that they would like to be on a trial, um, and so this allows them even using their uh, you know uh, measurements, lab measurements, and so forth, be on a potential trial, uh, and get that get that um, get that input. Um, so again, we had a number of these. I just want to show you two where they're very different in that one of them to show you kind of um, how integration across agency data allows veterans to benefit. The second one to show you that uh, even, you know, high, I mean, these are great high school students. I think two out of the three, I think all three got to like really top schools for their undergraduate, but, um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, high school students without prior experience working with us and others were able to develop something that got into an app store that you know was is used. So, so that's that story. Now I, I know people are interested maybe in following up, learning more, and so I wanted to leave information about our AI community of practice um, and our we do have an AI at VA University as well, and a few other ways we can connect. I usually leave a general email. I, I actually leave my own email here. Um, if you'd like to write me, um, and I'll try to get you in contact with the right person, depending on, on the question. Uh, our website, and you know, if you're interested in any of our communities and newsletter. Uh, and I think with that, if we have time for questions, we're going to do that next. Yes, we do have time for a couple of questions. Oh.
Oh, question in the back. Thanks very much. Thanks for a great talk. Um, do you have a roadmap for the, um, the the tech sprints, and how far out does that go if you do? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So two things. We have a standard operating procedure, sort of like how do you do a tech sprint that we put up on the web. I think you're more asking, though, like what are the topics of the tech sprints, right? Yes. And uh, for that, what I would say is, uh, Yes, but sometimes they change. So for example, we had one that was going to be around um, incidental findings in uh, chest x-ray and kind of uh, cardiothoracic tech sprint, essentially. That was going to be the theme for this year. Uh, but then the uh, AI executive order came out, uh, right? And then it's like, oh, well, let's, you know, let's make one that will affect the most number of patients. So ambient voice dictation, right? Like that could really affect a lot of patients quickly and affect uh, physician burnout, right? Like it was a large system thing. Um, so I think we're now re-exploring that one, uh, the cardiothoracic, we call it the cardiothoracic sprint, basically. Um, and so looking at imaging, imaging is, I was saying a billion images a year, there's definitely a lot of potential there. Imaging, there's, you know, how do we pick these? You know, there's potentially less issues around re-identification than maybe some of the, genomic or some of the other ones that we might look at. Uh, we, we would love to get suggestions for ones. You know, the types of things we're looking at are things that would apply, they could apply to anyone, but that it would be useful for veterans or their caregivers or the physicians, right? Like preventing burnout, uh, like which was the ambient voice dictation. Uh, ones that where we can take care of the issues around uh, any any bias issues that might like if a model was developed outside and then is applied in the VA, it may not apply because our population uh, has much fewer women, has more of a certain minority groups, so we have to retrain it. So there would have to be a way to do that, right? Um, and ones that maybe, you know, if there are issues to deal with the identification, de identification, like the images one, you know, potentially is easier, that may help facilitate. And then, of course, computational resources, you know, if you're doing Obviously, if you're doing something like, you know, like Sora, you know, like uh, that requires a lot of computation to make LLM generated videos, that, that might just not be something for a text print. Because we're basically giving, um, either giving resources that we're paying for, or uh, we want to make sure that it, it's not like people are limited because of the resources to, uh, to run, the, to demonstrate something. Any other? Thoughts or questions? And then, yeah, I left my email there, yeah. And I think that if you scan that, that also li links to either a LinkedIn or some web page. Otherwise, let's thank our speaker again. Yeah.